Hey, what's up? I'm Jason, and today we're going to talk about code smells and your Unity project. If you've never heard of code smells, it's essentially a term for parts of code that we can see or spot that lead us to believe that there's possibly an opportunity for improvement, some opportunity to maybe put in some design patterns or refactor things to make it a little bit less fragile, a little bit less brittle, and easier to work with. So in this example, what we're gonna do is take a look at the switch statement code smell. If you've used a lot of switches, don't worry, I'm gonna show you some really cool tricks so that you can avoid them. And if you've never used switches before, don't worry, I'll show you what those are, how they work, and how you should minimize them and what you can use as an alternative. So for this example, I've set up a simple character and the character is gonna use some spells on other characters. It would be able to use a spell on itself or maybe on some other enemy or target. We're mostly going to just dive into code and not look too much in the editor. But I wanted to set something up really simple. So we've got a character here. He's just a capsule. He's got some health and some speed. And if I hit one, you see his health goes up because I'm casting my heal spell. Again, we're going to see that all in just a second. If I hit two, nothing happens at all. Three, nothing happens. So let's dive into the code. Let's see what a switch statement looks like. And let's see why it's bad and how you can fix it. So here's our character class. Before I dive into the switch right here in the middle, let's just take a real quick overview of what we've got going on here. We have a health field, a speed field, and an is player field. Those are just variables that we can adjust and see in the inspector just to know what's going on and how things are working. And the is player you'll see we're gonna use for actual target checking. Then we have a public version of is player, which is just wrapping this private serialized field using an expression body property. If you've never seen this, it's just returning back the value of that, but making it so that we can't actually change the value of is player, but we can set it from the serialized field or from the editor. Then we have an update method. Well, we have a target here, but I'm just kind of hard setting this target, and I even put a comment that we would probably do something to pick a target. But our update is where some actual work happens. We check to see if I press alpha one, which is one on the keyboard, or alpha two, which is two on the keyboard. And you'll see that if I hit one, we call use spell on other character, we pass in the target, and we use a heal spell type. If we do two, then we do a damage spell type. Exact same code, just different value there. Now the spell type is an enum. Let's go to the definition of it. So I'm just gonna go to heal, click on it, and hit F12 to go to definition. And you see here that we have, in my example, three spell types that are actually hooked up, three that are not hooked up, that's why they're gray, because they're not referenced, and really the opportunity to add dozens or even hundreds of other spell types. Think of any game that you've played, all of the different spell types that could be there. Some games it might be tiny, but a lot of games it could be a giant, giant number of things. And that's kind of where this turns into a mess. So let's go back to the character. So if we look at our use spell on other character, and let's start zooming in here. Let's take a look at the code, nice and big. We take a target and a spell type, and then we check to see if the target is valid by calling into this spell target checker is valid target for spell type. We give it the thing, the, or ourself, the caster, the target, and the spell type, and it's gonna tell us whether or not it's valid. So we can only heal players if we're a player, we can only damage NPCs or non-players if we're a player, and then the opposite for players, or NPCs, right? NPCs can only heal each other and they can only damage players, at least in this example. Of course, we could have whatever setup we want and implement this however we want, but I wanted to show a simple implementation of that. Then we check to see if the target's valid. If it's not a valid target, we just bail out and don't do anything. But if the target is valid, we do a switch here. Now a switch will do some logic based on what the value of the thing that we're switching on is. So since the switch type is spell type, the thing that we're passing in here is spell type, we have case statements for the different possible values. So if the value here is damage, so if the one that we passed in is damage, then we're gonna call the code after this case statement, the target modify health and pass in a value of negative five and then break. The break just says, hey, we're ending the case, we're done with it, we don't need to do anything else, this is the one we've dealt with it. Now, you may also see switch statements that have brackets like this. It works the same, does the same thing. We can do it with or without the brackets. Just wanted to show that so that everybody knows that there's no real difference there. So then we check to see if it was damage, we did the damage. If it was a heal, we see that we're not actually doing negative damage. We're changing the health by positive 10. And if it's a root, then we call target.setSpeed. And let's take a real quick look at the modify health and set speed. Oh, we can just scroll down, you can see them. 
we add the health and set the speed. Very simple, right? Not a lot going on here. So you might think like, okay, this is cool, this works. So if we wanted to add in another one, we just go down here and add in the next case statement, right? And in fact, if we went and looked at our spell types to see that we haven't actually implemented most of these. So let's say we wanted to implement change model. And we went back over here. To do that, we would add a case statement, spell type, whoops, we have to fix that, dot change model, and we put a colon here. Then we'd say like target dot change model and give it whatever, maybe we'd be able to pass in a model type or something, but for now, we'll just pick a random model and break. And then we'd implement this on the target so that the target can actually change model. So to do that, by the way, I just hit Alt Enter and then Enter again to generate it. Uh, the, keyboard, uh, the keyboard shortcuts are a little bit different depending on the editor, but just about every editor will do that. There's a generate method, so just find it. Control period or Alt Enter is usually it. And then here we could maybe change the model, right? And you would think, okay, this this could work. Maybe it does something. In fact, let's 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 try it out, right? Let's do a debug.log. We're just we're not going to actually change the model, but we'll say changing model. This is going to show where this goes wrong and why we run into problems. Right, so I set this to changing model or say changing model, and I'm going to just go up here and when I hit alpha two. Instead of doing damage, I'll do change model. Now, of course, in a real game, we wouldn't hard code our spells to our abilities, probably. I mean, we might, depending on the, the type of game. But in general, we wouldn't really do this kind of a setup. But I wanted to keep it really simple so that we can demonstrate it. So let's hit play. In fact, for that kind of a setup, we'd probably build some hot bar system or something. So here we go. It started. Now I'm going to hit 2, but I want to go to the console window because I want to see the log. Nothing's happening, right? So if I hit one, I see my health is going up because the heal one's calling. But if I hit two, nothing's happening. The reason for that isn't obvious when you look in here, right? If I look in here and go, okay, why is this not working? It's actually because we're doing switch statements in more than one spot. And this is generally where switch statements become a nightmare. Because if they're in a single spot and it's nice and easy to read like this, it's fine. But what usually happens is that you'll find that you're doing the switch statement here and then you look around and maybe go into another method and you're doing another switch statement here and then you're doing it another place and another place and another place. So here you'll see that we're just not dealing with the case of that other spell type. So what do we want to do for that spell type? This is a change model. We really don't care, right? We just want to return true because I think the player should be able to do it to NPCs and NPCs should be able to do it to player. Right? Or maybe we want, um, let's, let's change it. Let's make it even crazier. Let's say for this one, we want change model. So we're adding a case statement for change model. We want it to only be true if the caster is the target. There we go. So now it's going to return true only if we're casting it on ourselves. So if we tried to cast it on somebody else, it wouldn't work. And now you'll see that it's going to work, right? Let's, let's go in, let's hit play and watch and see our logs. There we go. Look, I hit two, changing model. We're seeing the message appear. And if I hit one, the damage or the health goes up. So you might be thinking, okay, whatever, I'll do it in two places. The problem here, again, is that it's not going to be two places. As your project grows, things get more complicated. It's going to be three places, and then four places, and five, and six. And it's going to keep growing, and it's going to get more and more complex, and a whole lot harder to put in new functionality, and a lot easier to put in bugs. Because if I go in and start setting this up, and I don't implement it for everything... I'm going to have issues. And I also just have to go into a bunch of spots. I have to dig in and change code in a lot of areas. So I'm no longer following that single responsibility principle. Instead, I'm going in and changing this character or whatever the thing is and all of the other things that implement this switch every time I want to add a little bit of functionality. So let me show you how we can refactor that, at least in one way, to make it a little bit easier. There are a whole bunch of alternatives to switches, but this is just one way that works really well for a scenario like this that I want to show. So let's go back to our character. I'm going to zoom out a little bit, and I'm going to take this little line from the bottom that I've commented, and we're going to drop it right up here. And we'll comment these, these two out. And what we're going to do is use another class. So instead of going into our character and having a switch statement or having our character use the spell, uh, we're going to set up a spell processor that does it all for us and that manages the way spells work on its own so that the character doesn't really need to know much about it. 
So in fact, if I do that, I can even go in right here and just delete that right out. Um, we will leave the change model and we'll make that public. So how does this, how's this gonna work? Well, let's dive into the spell processor system. What we're gonna do is use the magic of reflection, abstract classes, and inheritance. So here we've got a spell processor class and you see it's got an initialize and a use spell on other character and a lot of code that may or may not look extremely confusing. So we're not gonna dive right into it. Instead, we're gonna go to the spell class. In fact, let's go to the project view just for a second. I just wanna show you what these files look like. So we have the character, we have the spell, spell processor, the target checker, and the spell type. That's the entirety of the project. Now let's go into the spell class. The spell class, I first just wanna point out has multiple classes in it. This file has many classes in it, and that is only to make it very easy to show you. It's not something that you should do. You should definitely split these files into their own class eventually. Let's take a look at the actual spell class itself, though. That's this one right up top. In fact, I'm gonna collapse all of these other implementations. So the spell class is an abstract class. That means that we can't instantiate it. You can't say, give me a new spell. You can't say, spell equals new spell. It's not possible, you have to inherit from it. It has a constructor, it needs to have a default constructor there. Um, it's got an abstract spell type property with only a getter on it. So this is gonna let us assign a spell type to a spell and well require it for each implementation. You'll see that in just a second. It has an abstract process on character that takes a target and doesn't return anything. And then it has a Boolean returning abstract is valid target method that takes a caster and a target and it will return us back whether or not the target is valid. So let's actually dive into an implementation now and look at the heal spell. In fact, let's clean this up while we're at it. So I'm on the heal spell. I'm gonna hold alt and hit enter and writer. I think it's again, control period in Visual Studio. And I'm gonna hit move to healspell.cs. I'm gonna clean up the code while we're doing this. And then we'll look at the implementation. So you see we've got a public class heal spell and the base class is that spell, that abstract one. And then here we're overriding the spell type to implement it and we're returning back spell type of heal. Again, this is the expression body property. We could also do something like git and then have it say return that. And we could write it all out like this, but writer's nice and just says, hey, just turn that into an expression body property and make it nice and short. So I do that. Then we have the process on character which modifies health. You'll see that it takes in the character, calls modify health, and finally an is valid target. And here we're just doing the same thing, an expression body property, and just returning back whether or not the caster is player value matches the target is player. So only players can hit players and only non-players can hit non-players for a heal. And that's it, so that's our heal implementation. And notice that there are no switch statements here. And you'll see that there aren't any throughout the rest of the code. So let's see how this heal actually works now in the heal processor. So the first thing we have here is an initialize method. And I'm gonna collapse that for just a second because this is what we're calling into. We're calling into use spell on other character. And we're checking to see if initialized is false and if it is not initialized, so initialized hasn't been set, we're calling the initialize method. Now, I also wanna point out that this is a static class with a static method and a static Boolean here and even a static dictionary. And that's because we're not going to instantiate the spell processor. The spell processor is almost stateless. The only state that it really has is whether or not it was initialized and it's only ever going to be initialized once in the lifetime of our application. So we can keep this all static and stateless as possible and keep it nice and clean. So how does this work? Once we check to see if it's initialized, well, if it's not, we call initialize and we'll dive into how that works in just a second. Then we get the spell from a spells dictionary by spell type. So if you've never used a dictionary before, it's a key value pair where we give it a type for the key and a type for the value. And then we can pass in the key in the in a, like an array indexer and get back the value. So if I pass in a spell type of heal, I will actually get back an object that is a heal spell object. And then I call process on character on that heal spell object. Now, if I pass in damage type, I'm gonna get back a damage type object. Now, you might wonder, well, how do we get this filled out? How does this work? And that's all in this initialize. So let's dive into initialize now. In fact, let's make this even bigger. 
initialize. So the first thing we do is we clear out this dictionary. We probably don't really need to do that. We could new it here or we could assume that it's clear, but there's no reason not to just call clear on it. If it's already empty, it's fine. If somehow this gets called again, we won't be doubling it up and causing exceptions and errors. So we we'll just clear it out. Then we use some reflection. This is kind of where the magic happens. So we're creating a I enumerable of types. This is basically like a collection or a list of the different types. Now a type is something like type of heal spell. It's the class type. So it's all of the different classes and the information about them. So we're getting all of them from this assembly. So the first thing that we do is get the assembly. In fact, let's just separate this out. So let's go control shift R and um, introduce a variable and call this assembly. Or right here, we'll just let it do it just like it did. So we get the assembly for the type of spell. So what it's gonna do is find the assembly in your project that contains the spell type. Now, if you're just doing a Unity project without any assembly definitions, it's just gonna be your main assembly. It's gonna be everything in there. Not a big deal though. Then we go through all of the types on that assembly. So we have the assembly, we get all of the types. This is gonna return back every type that's in our project. And then we use a link query to filter to where the spell type is assignable from the type that we're looking at. So we only want types from our assembly that can be spells, basically types that are implementing this spell abstract class. So we want things that look like this. That's when we say that uh, is assignable from, we're checking for this basically, that this heal spell is some type of a spell. Now there's one other check here. So we do the is assignable check and make sure that you get this right, don't go backwards. And, but we do this check right here, t.abstract is also false because we also don't want this class in our dictionary. This doesn't have a spell type, so it won't even fit in our dictionary. It doesn't do anything and we can't new it. So we have to make sure that we don't get the abstract one. Then I loop through all of the spell types and we call another magic little method here, activator.createInstance. And the way this works is you can give it a type at runtime and it will create an instance of that type. Now it's gonna return it back as an object so we just cast it as a spell because I know it's going to be a spell because I can see my code right there. And then once we get that instance of it, we add it to the dictionary. So we say spells.add, we give it the spell type. And remember this is gonna return back the implemented version of it. So on the heal spell, it's gonna return back heal spell. And then we add that in. In fact, I think it would be fun and interesting to just kind of step through this. So let's do it. Let's uh, uh, add a breakpoint here and I'm gonna hit F5. And if all goes well, I'll go in here, I'll hit play and we should get the initialize call right away not crash and everything will work magically. Get to see exactly what's going on here. All right, so it's running. Oh, I need to actually click, right? Because we don't initialize until I try to cast. There we go, I hit one, jump back over to the editor. And there we go, we've got spell types. It is an I enumerable or a where iterator array. And if I click on it, we can see the results. I can expand it out here. We have heal spell, damage spell, and root spell. And these are all just types. So then if we step in, so I'm just gonna hit, um, I can't hit F10 because that'll stop my recording. So I'm gonna add a breakpoint here, we'll hit F5. And then you'll see that we've added, or we've created a heal spell because that was the first type in there. So it took a heal spell, it created it, and the return value for spell type is heal. And if I just do like a, another F5, we'll go to the next one. And that's gonna give us the damage and we now have a damage spell. And if I hit a five again, it's gonna continue on one more time through the loop give us the root spell and the root spell type. And then if I hit it one more time, it should go to that initialized. Yep, and then I'll get rid of these breakpoints and hit a five. So hopefully that shows you what's happening. We're creating these objects, we're adding them to the dictionary and they're staying there forever so that we can use them again in our spell processor right here when we call that process on character. So let's add a breakpoint here. Let's just see what it's doing again. In fact, let's put them right there too. Go back in and I'm gonna hit two. That's the one for change model. What happened? Let's try it again. Nothing. So, oh, I know why. If we go back to our character, nothing happened because I didn't actually implement it here. So let's stop playing and we will uh, copy that, drop it down and put change model there. And hit F5 again to start debugging. We'll go back. Oh, I need to stop the editor before it 
Stop both of them. If you're ever debugging, by the way, make sure that you stop everything. Go back in, rebuild, which is Control Shift B in here or F6, um, and then then attach. If you attach and stop and try to change things while the editor's still running, um, you won't get a new version and everything will be weird and not work right. Okay, so there we go. We're in and we're going to hit two. And here's our breakpoint. We're at the initialize check. We have not initialized. Again, I can't hit F10, but I'll hit F11. You see that it steps there and it wants to initialize. I'm just going to let it initialize. I'm going to hit F5 and go down to this breakpoint. So here we're going to get the model from the dictionary, or we're going to get the spell for change model from the dictionary. So I hit F5 again. And look what happened. We got an error or something. It didn't continue on. If I go back over here, say, hey, this doesn't exist in the dictionary. Now this is where we actually go in and implement a new one. So we've set up the code for it. We have the change model call on our character, but we need to actually add the spell type here. And we're, again, we're not gonna go in and just add in another dictionary entry. Instead, what I'll do is just go into heal spell and I'll probably just copy it, paste it. I'll change this to be um, change model spell. I'll change this to be change model. And then here we'll change the way it processes to do change model. Again, the processing will probably be a bit more complicated. We'll also change this constructor. The default constructor should match the name, not be something wrong and invalid that causes an error. But again, the process I was going to say should be relatively complex sometimes. Sometimes it's going to do more than just call a single method on a thing. And that's, again, where the switch statements will get messy because... You know, right now we have that one liner in there. When those grow out to be four, five, six, ten lines or start to call a bunch of methods, it gets a lot more complicated. If we have it in the separate code, the separate class file, it's a whole lot easier to manage. And we know where everything is for this thing. So change mode spell or change model spell, I mean. It's going to call change model. And then how does the targeting work again? Oh, that's right. We want to check to see if the caster is the target. The other nice benefit here is now I can tell exactly how this thing works for targeting. Since the effect type here is determining it, I can just look and say, hey, this only works on things where the caster is the target. And then I can just go right here and move this to a new file, save it off, and rebuild, stop editing, or stop debugging, rebuild, and all that stuff, and then go back in. I should be able to hit two and have it actually work. Let's see, two, nope. Nothing. Why didn't it work? So let's let's take another peek. Oh, it did work. It just was really slow on the logging. Nice. Apparently, I have to click over to the log window. Oh, that's a weird, new, interesting issue. I've never seen that before. Anyway, it does look like it's working. It's working fine. Just some weirdness with my editor, probably in my recording setup. But I hope that this kind of explains how to avoid a switch, or at least one way to avoid a switch. There are a ton of other cases where you might see yourself using a switch statement, but most of the time what ends up happening is you'll start with something small like that character was initially, then you'll add in the target checker, you'll add in some other thing, you'll add in another thing, and as these systems keep growing and getting more and more complex, you'll start to find problems. I've seen this with like tile types on a, on a ping pong style game or like a Tetris game or... Um, just about anything, you're going to end up with switches and enums, and you want to try to minimize how much of a mess those get to be, and just start refactoring, start cleaning things up, and when you start to see big, big cases, refactor them right away. Now, if you're looking for where are some really good places for switch statements, the best one that I know of and the one that I've, I've heard everybody say is the, the number one spot is in some sort of a factory class. And a factory class is basically, a, it's usually a static class that you call into, give it some info, maybe some enum type or some data, and then it, it will return back out a pre-made class that's all ready to go. If you're not familiar with that, don't worry, I've got a video on the factory pattern you can go check out and it'll tell you all about that. And I think I even dive a bit into using some of the same, uh, the same functionality and a little bit of reflection in there. Now, if you have code smells you're curious about or just wondering if something's bad or good or 
a better way to do something, uh, drop a comment below and let me know. I'd be curious to see what everybody is interested in and what kinds of things you guys are running into. Also, if you have other good solutions for switch statements or other code smells, I'd love to hear them. It's always interesting for me to find out new stuff and just talk to people about this kind of stuff. And again, thanks for watching. Special thanks to everybody on Patreon and all my email subscribers and everybody out there. You guys are awesome. Really appreciate it. Um, bye.